I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is the most amazing vegan pastry chef. She's the pastry queen as far as I'm concerned. And she's going to be show us, showing us how to make a very easy three ingredient vegan ganache that has multiple uses. And before I introduce her, I just want to remind you, if you like stand-up comedy, my husband and I, along with Thomas Allen of California Balsamic, who sponsors this show and gives two free bottles of vinegar to every guest, if they live in the United States, is going to be performing stand-up comedy on Zoom. And you can watch from the privacy of your own home and I'll post the link in the chat. I have been so excited that this guest is coming on. I've been waiting for a long time. She's as beautiful as her food is, and her name is Fran Costigan. Welcome to the show, Fran. I'm so delighted to see you. Oh, AJ, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And I am, I've been waiting for a long time to be on your show. That's for sure. Um, you know, we met a long time ago. You and I met when I was doing when Dr. McDougall had his Celebrity Chef Weekends. That was the very first time. Oh my time. God, I can tell you that was June of 2009. Is that right? Yeah, that was so, a long time ago. And I developed this no fat added, no oil added chocolate cake to live for for him for that weekend. And that became Rip Esselstyn's wedding cake. So, you know, what I want to say right off the bat, and I always do, and AJ and I have talked about this, is I'm not pushing desserts. I believe, I'm certainly not pushing sugar. I believe that desserts are a treat. We have celebrations. We have a holiday coming up. We have birthdays, hopefully, and weddings. Even, you know, when Rip Esselstyn said, I want that chocolate cake, I knew. Desserts are not one of the five food groups, that's for sure, but they can be enjoyed in moderation when they're made with clean ingredients. And I believe in smaller portion size. And you can see over my shoulder, maybe there's a big pile of green because what I eat every day, and I do have a small treat, is greens and grains and beans. I follow a really healthful diet and knock on wood, I have four grandchildren, it has kept me really healthy. So I want to get started on what I'm making because when you're doing desserts, it's a bit different from cooking insofar as when you're doing a cake, you can't really fix a batter. You know, you have to follow all the rules. So I'm very big on a concept I call mise en place, which just means getting everything together. For example, I have these prep trays all ready to go now. What is ganache? Ganache is typically, it's an emulsion. It's typically a percentage of chocolate in a particular percentage. And, a, and traditionally there's heavy cream, sometimes there's butter added, other corn syrup, things that I don't use. I have a whole chapter in my book on various truffles. I've got one made with orange juice and tahini and so on. But I just want to show you, it's so easy to make this and stays in your freezer. So I am definitely about to make this ganache, but just to make the point that everything can be made ahead, this came right out of my freezer. So this was ganache that was made ahead. I can make this into truffles which are little rounds and can be coated. I'm gonna coat them a few different ways. And depending on the final use, perhaps I want to use it as a cake glaze and I'm gonna glaze some little mini cupcakes. You add more milk. Now, the simplest way to do it is with plant milk of your choice. You heat it until it's steaming hot. I like to bring it to a low boil this milk is a little yellow because I decided today I wanted some ginger and turmeric and black pepper in my truffles. So the plant milk, really anything that you like, except rice milk. Rice milk's a little low in protein for making truffles. The right chocolate to use is the one that tastes good to you right out of the package. But that said, you have to use the percentage that's listed in the recipe. So I tend to use 70 to 72%. Those are lower sugar chocolates. My chocolates have 
chocolate, cacao mass, and that's pretty much it. Although I did just find a chocolate, I'm going to look for the label at Trader Joe's of all places. That's an 85. Yeah, so, I, I noticed. Well, I noticed now at Trader Joe's they have one. I think that it's 100. percent There's absolutely no sweetener in it. 100 percent chocolate is really all chocolate mass, and if you start using those, here's. Let me get this. Let me get this done because once the milk is hot, we don't mess around. So the first rule is to use the right chocolate that's in the recipe, but one that you like. And you can see that this is chopped very finely. You take the liquid, I'm gonna do it over here. You pour it absolutely all at once over the chocolate. If you just trickle it in, you're going to have a problem. The chocolate's gonna get hard and it's going to seize. And then you take a bowl, I mean a plate, and you cover it for a minute or two. You wanna get the chocolate melting slowly into the hot liquid. We want the smoothest result. Now, you can do any number of things. I'm gonna speed that up. I'm gonna put a little water in here because I'm going to melt some of the ganache that I already made. It's funny because the word ganache, it sounds like nash, which means eat, you know? Yeah, but you know, for a lot of, for people who know pastry work at all, if you've ever had a truffle, you've had ganache. So it's the center of a truffle. It's pouring over a cake. It's spread on a piece of baguette, you know, whole grain baguette, and you have what's a crostini. I had that in Spain, actually, it's delicious. Pour a little bit into some plant milk with a little seltzer, if you're from Brooklyn like I am, and you have an eggless cream, just a little bit is enough. And then when it's set, you have these beauties. So. These are truffles that I made recently from the ganache that I showed you. Wait for it to firm up. And then I put in cocoa powder, pure cocoa powder, no sugar cocoa powder. And I put a little piece of ginger on the top because I liked it. These have some sesame seeds on them. I've used hemp seeds. You can use chopped almonds, whatever you want. I'm going to stuff some dates for you with this ganache too because I love dates. I love Majol dates. I can frankly only eat one half. I find dates very sweet, very, very sweet. And I cannot eat sweet in the morning. My morning is oatmeal with some kale in it. I have to be very standardized about my breakfast or I won't eat it. So there you go. So here, this is all I have to do. I'm going to take a whisk, if you use a whisk, you go very slowly because you don't want to get air in your ganache. And once the chocolate is melted into the liquid, you stop. So over stirring can be a problem. It can turn your ganache gritty. Or if you say, wow, that looks really beautiful, but you know what? What's that oil slick on the top? The fat in Chocolate is called cocoa butter and it's not dairy, but it is, it is a fat. And when that happens, I mean, my students at the Ruby Essential Vegan Desserts course know how to fix it, but the point is we don't wanna to get to there. So I'm just going to stop. I always have parchment paper around that I reuse. And here, look at that, it's just gorgeous. It's, it's beautiful. Just, Did you know that chocolate is the number one crave food in the world, even above pizza? Is that right? Yeah, I, even above pizza. I know that chocolate actually has some benefits, the pure chocolate, the cocoa bean, but you'll never, ever hear from my mouth. <laughs> you'll never hear the words, eat chocolate, be healthy, eat, ma drink maple syrup, be healthy. These are treats. So I'm going to set this aside, but before I do that, here's another little rule for you. And that is, I make thousands of these and I'm sure I make ganache every week, a couple times a week. I made a half recipe here. I take a little bit off my stirring spoon or off my whisk and put it in a little bowl like this. I wanna make sure before I commit that to 
you know, getting chilled or used or whatever, I want to make sure that it is going to be the right consistency for what I'm intending. For a truffle, I want it firmer. For a pouring glaze, I want it thinner. So you take a little bit, do this with pudding, with anything, put it in the fridge for five, 10 minutes, and you'll know, you'll know what you have. And then I'm going to, once it firms up a little bit, I'm gonna dip some apricots, I'm gonna stuff a date. I have on my mise en place tray, this is just a little extra chocolate. If that chocolate is thinner than I want it to be, the ganache, I'll melt some chocolate and add it slowly. If it's thicker than I want it to be, well, then I'll just add a little bit more plant milk. Now, I know when I'm doing this for a lot of people, and some of you who are listening might, you know, have the same situation. I have no allergies. I mean, I have been eating plant foods. I've been eating vegan for close to 30 years now. And I love it. I mean, I don't miss anything. I just love the variety of food. But I make a couple of assumptions. I assume nut allergic and I assume soy avoiders. I eat soy, I eat edamame, I eat tofu, I eat good forms of soy. So I tend not to make my truffles when I'm serving them. I don't make them with soy milk for other people. But soy milk actually, and I just buy the soy milk that is just soybeans and water, is wonderful. Oat milk is a great plant milk to use when you're considering people with different kinds of allergies. So now let me grab this made ganache and I'm going to make some couple of truffles while I wait for this to firm up. I'm just going to put this away. Did you go to a pastry school? I went to traditional culinary school, AJ. Um, my kids were young preteens. So I was one of the older students. Well, I probably was the oldest student in the class. Um, it was a long time ago. I wasn't vegan then. And I just, you know, I grew up in a home with a mom who didn't cook. <laughs> so nobody, uh, she couldn't really understand what I was doing, but my mother-in-law was a great cook. And I just found that I loved I loved everything. So I didn't have an idea about what I was going to be doing, but I, I gravitated towards this. And I'm really happy that I had that experience because when you're doing desserts, rules matter. And so I created with Ruby Online Culinary School, which is the biggest online school really in the world, a 90 day essential vegan desserts course. And it is fully vegan. However, at, this, at the same time, no, however, at the same time, we teach foundational technique. I want everyone to love this food. I don't want anyone saying this is good for what it is. So you have to learn some rules. So now all I have to do with this firmer ganache, people who are fussier than I am use little, you know, the little ice cream scoops to make perfect rounds. But I just, I want truffles to be like their mushroom truffle, the really expensive truffles. I want it to be like their cousins. So I just kind of squish this together and I work factory style. I'm gonna make a bunch of those and then coat them with pure cocoa powder. Now, if you didn't want to infuse your milk, the base recipe is for a half recipe, it's four ounces of 70 to 72% chocolate. And for truffle ganache, probably about a half a cup of plant milk heated. Now, I, you know, and as I said, and then you can change it up depending on, depending on what you're using. But if I didn't want to infuse that milk, and most of the time I don't, the ones I showed you with the little ginger, I just, dust these with cocoa powder and then put some ginger on the top, which looks like gold. It looks so pretty and you get a different kind of a taste. So here you go. Now, another thing you can do, if you, if you pour your ganache into a square kind of a dish and you're making a lot and you don't want to 
make these little balls. I cut them into squares, which is kind of handy as well. I didn't, you see, mesoplast is really important, but I'm still really excited. There's so much dancing going on outside my window in Philadelphia. I'm gonna get some cocoa powder and show you how to coat them. I didn't realize you lived in Philadelphia. Now I always think of you from, as living in New York. I am a lifelong New Yorker. I was born in New York. I moved to Philly three years ago now, and I just love it here. I was invited to be a judge for a vegan Philly cheesesteak. I didn't even know what a cheesesteak was at the time. I came here. I judged it. I just love this city. It's a real city. It's a super vegan friendly city. And it's very walkable, very manageable. So everything is here that I had in New York. And when I, I mean, in normal times, I go back and forth very, very easily. So that's, that's the story with that. I did not know that. I went to Penn, so I lived there for many years. Do they st is the restaurant The Frog still there? Which restaurant? It was called The Frog. Oh, I, I heard about The Frog. I don't think it's still there. But I have a lot of, a lot of my cousins um, have gone through Penn, and I go over there all the time. It's a beautiful campus. Did you... Do you know about Veg Restaurant? I'm sure that you've heard, heard of it, but I, you know, I left in 1979 and they didn't. So Veg, the, the, it's a vegan restaurant. Chef Rich and his wife, Kate, are James Beard nominated finalists. They, their food is unbelievable. I live about four minutes away. So there are people who think I moved here. Jill Nussenau included. And Jill's watching, by the way. I oh, hi, Jill. Well, Jill came and stayed with me shortly after I moved here, and she was here for a very, very short time. But we hit, there was vegan restaurants just up and down the street. So all I did here was coat these with a little bit of the cocoa powder. Now, when you're making a batter-based dessert, and by that I mean a cake, like the cake in my cookbook, Rips No Oil Cake, or the regular one, or the gluten-free version, you have to use the cocoa powder that the recipe states. Dutch process, also called alkalized, also called European style, or natural. And if you don't, the leavening goes off. But this, this and hot chocolate, for example, you can use whatever whatever you want. So I'm going to hit these truffles with just a little bit of ginger powder, put them in something prettier. And then there we go. There we go with the, with the truffles. And honestly, keep them in your freezer, keep them cold serve them at room temperature. They're super, super, super creamy and yummy. Now, yeah, thank, thank you for put, doing close-ups of everything because people like to see them. Yes. So this is, for some people, this is small. For me, this is the right size of a cake, of a mini cake. It's a two-bite cake. This is uh, this happens to be gluten-free. I am not gluten-free, but I want to be inclusive for everyone. This has is made with prune puree. The recipe is on my website, frankostigan.com. A lot of recipes on my website and not only des mostly dessert, but some savory. And it's just yummy. So I'm going to dip this in some of the ganache I made which is thickening up nicely. Have you ever been to Bookbinders? I guess there's probably nothing vegan there. Um, I haven't been, but you know, I everybody has something vegan nowadays. People, restaurants who don't have vegan options are leaving money on the table. The train has left the station. And please, I don't want a plate of steamed vegetables only over a pasta and I don't want a fruit plate for dessert. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm dipping this in, lifting it out. And I've got this gorgeous little cupcake. I made a kind of a against friends rules here. When you're dipping into ganache, you wanna pour, this is my mother bowl. 
You want to pour some ganache into a smaller bowl because the temperature change back and forth with the cold cakes might be a bit of a problem. But I'm going to show you something else that I love to do. So it's the same cake. It's the same cake. I'm going to dip the bottom side. And what happens is we eat with our eyes. So you build the plate out with some fruit or some cashew date cream, for example, and you have a little plated dessert, which I think is just fabulous. So again, I'm going to go in, but the bottom side, let it drip off, give it a little shake. Put it in here to set. And I'm going to put some maple cranberries in here, which are, I love cranberries. I, I like, I actually like tart flavors. I really like tart flavors. I like um, lemon desserts a lot. And I like lemon and chocolate together. And then I'm gonna go and get some dates to stuff with this ganache. Wow. Do you have a very favorite dessert? Um, <laughs> it's like which of my grandchildren <laughs> is my most favorite. It depends on the season, AJ. I really like to eat seasonal desserts. So right now, what I like is comfort food. You know, I'm in, I'm a quite a social person. I'm certainly doing my share of online classes, which is great like this, you get some interaction going, I'm seeing friends, but not together. So I, my favorite dessert right now is chocolate pudding. <laughs> it's just, it's quick to make, I can control, it's as fast as opening a box, but I can control the sugar. I use coconut sugar to make it. And then if I really want to go crazy, I take one of the cake layers from my freezer and you take that chocolate pudding and fill and frost a cake and put the crumbs over it. And that's called, if there's anybody here from Brooklyn, <laughs> that is a very famous bakery called Ebinger's that had this blackout cake. And it is amazing. And you don't have to be a cake artist because you're just filling and frosting a cake with chocolate syrup. So Monica says, I just made the ganache for your essential vegan desserts class. Fran, it's amazing. I can't wait to try those two bite cakes to dip them in. Do you also store the two bite cakes in the freezer until serving or the refrigerator? Well, first of all, I'm really glad that you made the ganache and we're successful. The only people who aren't going to be successful is if you use chocolate chips instead of a nice chocolate. I, I keep those cakes in the freezer they're very fudgy, so they don't get hard. And I like the chew that way. So I tend to use my freezer, but if I, you know, let's say I wanted to serve this pretty soon, I would keep this at room temperature or put it in the refrigerator or put it in the fridge. So what I have here is, you know, oops, and I very fussy about plating, but I've got that cake. I've got some cranberries and then because it's the season, not everybody's going to agree with this. <laughs> and believe it or not, I'm not a big pumpkin person. <laughs> Don't, but I've got this um, spiced pumpkin butter. No, you know what? I'm going to save that for my toast. I'm going to save that for toast. So here's a nice, you know, to me, this is enough of a dessert. I don't know, AJ, would that be enough for you? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm a volume eater. You know, I think about Rancho La Puerta where you, me and Jill all have the privilege of presenting. Oh. and their dessert they serve. It's literally the size of a postage stamp. Right. Well, you know, Sean Nolan, who is a really, a really good friend and a very beloved whole food, whole food plant-based, no oil chef in Philadelphia and beyond. She, <laughs> when we first met, she looked at my truffle. And she said, that's it. <laughs> she said, the ones in the store are golf balls. That's the problem. I, you know, I have students from across around the world and European people in my, you know, that I've come across in my dessert classes say, what's with your American muffins? 
they're like mini cakes. And that's what I think. I think they're mini, mini cakes. You know, one or two bites of something that's really delicious is enough. What happens is when you start taking out the good, you know, if you use a low percentage chocolate or, you know, you just start messing around, your body is looking for that sweet taste. And there are studies that show that these artificial sweeteners, you just keep eating. You just keep eating them because, or they give you a stomach ache or something. I limit the amount of sugar, but I use enough to make a dessert taste like a dessert. In my very first job, I worked at Angelica Kitchen in New York City as a pastry chef, but before that I worked at a macrobiotic restaurant and I had just changed my diet. My stomach hurt all the time and I read Food, or food and Healing and I'm like, bingo, <laughs> lactose intolerant. But what happened was I gave up all animal foods and I felt great and I liked the new food, so I never looked back. But I was a little bit evangelical about sugar. So I took the restaurant's recipe for brownies and I took all the sugar out of it. And my boss said, Costigan, you're making brownies, not brown bread. Put some of the sugar back in. You know, so that said, you can, the old fashioned recipes, you can reduce some of the sugar, but sugar does more than just sweeten. So you have to think about all the different properties. Now, I'm going to take something as little as a an almond and I have a chocolate covered almond. I'm going to make a really pretty plate here soon. I kind of raid my refrigerator to see what I have because I don't like waste. This is chopped pistachio nuts. I was making a pistachio butter the other day so I can coat some truffles with pistachio nuts, or I think, I think pistachios and chocolate go nicely. So here I've just built, okay, there's one truffle, there's one cupcake. Look how beautiful that glaze is. It's shiny and there's a truffle. And then I will put some of this beautiful red cranberry on the plate. So, you know, there's lots you can do and holidays are coming up. Let's give ourselves a treat. I'm just going to go and grab some dates that I have yeah. in my freezer. Go ahead. While you were doing that, I was looking up the nutritional information of the Costco muffins because, the, you know, when you talk about the size in America, everything is supersized now. And one Costco muffin has 690 calories, 38 grams of fat, 11 of them saturated, and, you know, somebody that if you need only 2000 calories a day, that's like a 30 year calories for one little muffin. It's not going to fill you up. No. And I'm sure that's got a bunch of other things in there that we don't want to eat <laughs> for sure. That's well, you know, you think about calorie density and that is not going to fill you up. So these are dates. I been buying dates from a company called Rancho Metalucho. And it's a women owned company. They're in the Palm Desert where all the dates are grown and so on. And um, they are absolutely delicious. So I rinse, I rinse everything before I use it. So I rinse the dates and then I pit them, but I look at every single one because every once in a while, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, every once in a while there's a little black in there and it's bad. So you wanna make sure. Sometimes that's a little treat for me. You put a date in the freezer and you think you're eating caramel. It just has that flavor. But let's say somebody special, AJ's in town. She came back to see school and she came to visit me. Well, I can take a little bit of, you know what? I'm going to take the ganache that I already have made this is really funny this is called kitchen eyes we don't know <laughs> where everything is but i'm gonna put a little tiny that is i will bet you that what i just put in there was a quarter of a teaspoon of ganache but it's going to hit 
speaking of a quarter of a teaspoon, I have taken raspberries, you know, the little hole in the top of the raspberry and filled it with ganache and put them out for dinner. So you're having fruit with this hit of chocolate and it just reads, it reads ganache, you know, it reads chocolate. And then this is going to set up right away because the dates were cold. And there's a, a treat for you. And you can stop at any point here. Eat the, eat the frozen date. Put some nut butter inside of the date. Put some chopped nuts inside of the date. Put some chocolate ganache inside of the date. Or you can put some... I just... That's hemp seed. Hemp seed. And this reads big to me. This reads big enough to be actually a decent sized dessert. So, you know, I have all these little dishes because I think that it makes it, makes it look nicer. I'm not gonna put this on a giant plate, but you know, that is going to be a very, very satisfying dessert as far as I'm concerned. Another thing that you can do, not for breakfast necessarily. I just want to say, Jordana says, I noticed that every single guest I have on the show has the most beautiful glow and skin and energy. On one oh. weekend and down six pounds, excited and look forward to each show. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. You know, Victoria Moran and everybody has just like, like you say, the vegan glow, right? I, that's such a nice thing to hear. And I know it's it seems to be true. Like ladies and gentlemen out there, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but I do have four grandchildren and I am well beyond a senior. And it's, it's the eating and it's the joy and it's, it's all really, it's all really terrific. So this is whole grain bread. I do this, you can make a crostini and then that's fancy, but I actually don't have any today. But if you wanted to, you just take some of the same ganache and you really have bread and chocolate. Some bread and chocolate, a little bit of chopped nuts or whatever. So this is not like having, you know, avocado toast for breakfast. This is for a treat. But if you don't have one of my cakes in your freezer and you know, or those little mini cupcakes that comes in handy, you can do this. And I'm gonna put some more topping on there. Almost like Nutella. It is, and you know, I make my own Nutella with tahini or any kind of nut butter. I happen to really like tahini and I use a Philadelphia brand called Soom, S-O-O-M. It's three sisters. And speaking of that, I'm glad you brought that up, Chef AJ. So this is something that is really ancient, but relatively new to me. This is a liquid sweetener that is date syrup. It's steamed and pressed dates. And I never liked the taste of molasses. And with molasses, unless you are using an organic molasses, it's a byproduct of sugar refining and it's gonna be a chemical soup. And I don't want chemicals and I just don't. So this is to me is like a better tasting molasses. And if you look up date syrup, AKA Ceylon, S-I-L-N, a-N, that's where it comes, it comes from the middle, you know, it's been used in the Middle East for millennia. And that's another criteria for me, like how was a food used? They give it to nursing mothers and mothers going into labor and so on. It's, there's quite, there's a very nice nutritional profile. But yeah, and it's, it's a whole food and you technically can make date syrup yourself, even though I don't do it anymore because I, I buy a brand called I Love Date Lady, it's organic. Uh -huh. And actually they're giving, she's Colleen is giving away an entire year supply of date syrup. So those of you that haven't entered my contest, the rules are on my website. It, uh, the deadline is November 11th 
at midnight. And not only can you win that, you can win a $569 nutter milk machine that makes nut butters and all kinds wow. of plant milks without any straining or pulp. So thanks for bringing up date syrup. So Fran, we have an, a question from Monica. How do you get the fancy thin chocolate drizzle on top of muffins and cupcakes? I use a spoon and I get blobs sometimes and not even professional looking drizzles. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So I have this cake that was from my freezer and this is the famous McDougal Rip Esselstyn chocolate cake to live for, no oil version. You can see that there is already some ganache glaze on there. And the lighter color is gold luster dust, which I buy edible gold luster dust because I want our desserts to be absolutely beautiful. Now let's see what we can do to drizzle. I think Monica's going to be surprised and think that I'm going to bring out some kind of a really special tool, but I'm not. <laughs> I use a fork or right off a whisk and I want to get let me see. So here we go. And you just go like this. A little higher, a little higher up. So Monica and everyone else who might be curious, you can get a, you can get a little, make a little pastry bag or get a little squeeze bottle and make sure the ganache is at the right temperature so that it will drip not too thin, not too thick. Practice on a piece of wax paper or a parchment paper first, and you just do what you wanna do. I do this often on plates because I think it's really attractive on a plate to have that drizzle as well. So they're really, sometimes I wish I had, you know, oh, it's really hard to do, or <laughs> it's really magic. What I'd say is when I do a pouring glaze, like for example, well, no, I'm not gonna bother showing you that. You know, it doesn't always come as beautifully glazed as this cupcake. Then I take a fork with the same glaze and I go like that over it. I call that my Picasso effect. And it builds a little more topping. So again, we're eating a smaller portion, but we're eating with our eyes. It's more satisfying. This is something else you can do right out of my freezer. This is some leftover cake. Yes, there is a thing. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up yo-yo dieting. I mean, I'm confessing to a lot of people here, but I really did. I was finished with the ice cream when there was no more left in the box. That's just the way it was in my house. And then I went to pretzels. There was something about the sweet and the whatever. Now, because I, I'm positive, it's because I'm eating a well-rounded, wholesome, satisfying diet, that one little piece of something, it really is enough. And if I'm in a kind of a mood where I think it's not going to be enough, then I just don't go there at all. But this was leftover cake. I dried it out in a low oven. I made crumbs in my food processor. I keep them in a bag. So if I wanted to further build up a cake, Without adding much, I just gave it another layer. That, that would be good like on ice cream too. It's so good on ice cream. So I make, uh, that's something that I don't keep in my apartment. I mean, we, you know that we have wonderful vegan ice creams now. So, so many of the non-vegan brands have made ice cream, but that's something I don't like really having around. Now, one of the most favorite recipes in the Essential Vegan Desserts course is Baked Alaska. So Baked Alaska, for anyone who doesn't know, is it's a piece of cake, typically, ice cream, maybe a sauce, and then meringue all over it, and then you torch it. It is so good. Well, because of aquafaba, which is the liquid from chickpeas, and I have a foolproof way of making sure that's going to turn into a meringue, we can have vegan. What I do is I make nice cream. I make a banana ice cream when I want to. I always have frozen sliced bananas in my freezer, put it in my 
I find it's easier in my food processor than in my Vitamix. And I will add some cocoa powder. I will more likely add some frozen strawberries, frozen blueberries. I've done it with chopped medjool dates and a little bit of the date syrup because the dates don't freeze hard. It's like having caramel ice cream. And so that's my ice cream. Then, because, you know, as I said, I always have some ganache around. <laughs> I mean, I just do. Then I might take a teaspoon and put it on top and it sets. And this bingo, you have all these desserts. I, I go on kicks right now. I'm just loving apricots. Maybe because we're not getting as much sun as we was were. So you know, same thing. Um, Lisa wants to know where she can get the cake recipe. The cake recipe. All right. So the recipe is in my cookbook, vegan chocolate, unapologetically luscious and decadent dairy free desserts. But because I want everyone to make, you know, I want as many people as possible to be able to make these vegan desserts. You can find it on my website. And so you will find the, what I call the standard version, which has oil in it as a fat. However, for people who are not whole food plant-based, no oil, understand that the amount of fat is very minimal. I have a gluten-free version and I have the no fat added version. So make it, go to my website, frankostigan.com. You can follow me on Instagram, I'm good cakes ran everywhere except on my Facebook page. And you're going to find a lot of recipes. And, and Chef AJ mentioned Rancho La Puerta, where Jill and I have had the, oh my God, it's so beautiful. You, you know, they send us a spreadsheet saying, this is what's fresh in the organic garden the week you're going to be there. So the first time, AJ, that I went, I made a savory meal. And, though, and I have... So I have a savory section on my website as well, but I made the snow oil. I made the chocolate cake as well. And every time I went for a hike or went in to take a yoga class, it's the only thing people were talking about. So in subsequent, <laughs> subsequent visits to the ranch, I have done all dessert classes. And you know, this is a spa, they want us to limit. So these smaller portions really make sense. They really make sense. I, you know, I would, I would eat an almond with a little bit of chocolate on it when I want, when I'm, when I want something more than an almond. I don't eat nuts all day long. I don't put them on my oatmeal. I don't put walnuts on my oatmeal. I save that for a snack. So it's a matter of, of pacing. And I think for me, since I stopped denying myself, you know, for sure, I'm going to eat that later. <laughs> There's no question about it. But, you know, I will already have had my bowl. That is great. Well, God, you're just, you're just amazing. And you're just, you look amazing. And your food looks amazing. And I think that's why you look amazing, because your food's amazing. I want food to taste good. I don't always need fancy, fancy food. And I have, I mean, I've been, I live alone. <laughs> I haven't been cooking three meals a day for myself. So I'm very happy with, you know, I batch cook. If I don't, I'm gonna eat something I don't want. So I have a grain, I have a bean, I have some greens, you know, I have some roasted vegetables. I have some roasted potatoes in my fridge now and I can just make a nice bowl. But I also wanna know that I can have a little, a little something like this. I'm just looking, I wanna show you something else. This recipe is on my website and it's something that I took something more complicated and made it easier, but the same piece of whole grain bread. This is pumpkin butter that I make. And I've got two different recipes on my website for it. You can, I use canned pumpkin unless I have some squash puree left around in my fridge, which I almost always do. But I learned when I was making pumpkin pie a couple of years ago, and I have a really nice pumpkin pie recipe um, available, 
that cooking the spices in to the pumpkin, and I think the pumpkin in the can is really squash. I don't think it's pumpkin. I think somebody figured that out. It just enhances the taste. So if you're really pressed for time or you really don't want to, sure, go ahead and add some cinnamon, add some nutmeg, add some ginger. I happen not to like a lot of clove, so I might use a little bit or none at all and mix it up. And okay, you've got what you want. I add some date paste to this. But I'm telling you, if you try cooking the spices in, you'll never go back. And then put it in the freezer till you need it. It just tastes so good. So I don't mind having this for breakfast. And then again, I might have some hemp seeds on there and I might have some, you know, you can really, you can really make this into your, into your avo toast if you want. Pumpkin seeds, I think that they're really important for zinc. I mean, all of these foods have medicinal properties to them, but that doesn't mean ick. It means, wow, isn't that great? I'm getting all this vitamin A eating this and all this fiber, isn't that terrific? And I also, you know, I eat it off the spoon too. <laughs> Why not? I've, I've made banana ice cream with this and it's just really delicious. So it's a matter of getting yourself set up like anything else with cooking, especially with desserts for sure. And then going crazy. I'm sure I have some pumpkin seeds. You know, I have this mise en place kind of all over the place here. Right before the stay at home happened, I was ready to break all the walls and get myself a new kitchen. And it's such a good thing that I didn't have that happen because I would have no kitchen for six months now. Wow. So I'm managing just fine. You don't need a lot of space. You don't need a lot of things. But look at this. I mean, that's- Oh my God, it looks delicious. And it's just about lunchtime yeah. here. And this I will eat for breakfast or, you know, a snack with during the day or, or something. I mean, I'm a big fruit person during the day. I love apples. I like- citrus fruit this time of the year. I like, I like to chew. <laughs> I bet the ganache would be great on sliced apples. I, I have not done that. I have done the butter, the pumpkin butter on apples, but one of the assignments in essential vegan desserts is chocolate dipping. And it teaches a few different lessons. And one is making sure the ganache is at the right consistency. And the other is some foods dip better than others. So I hadn't thought about apples and ganache, but you know what? A number of students have done it. And it is, I mean, it's sort of one of those things where you say, what could be bad? Yeah, it sounds delicious. So there's a question, what kind of cookie would you recommend that you put the ganache on? Well, I would say your, your favorite cookie would be the one. It really works. There, I want, if you're taking a cookie and melting it and dipping it in some melted chocolate, melted chocolate stays crispy. Ganache is made with a liquid. So over time, maybe an hour, maybe longer, your cookie can get soggy. I keep, so I dip them and keep them in the freezer. If that, I hope that answers your question, but my, you know, I have two cookies that I really like. I happen to like crispy cookies, not chewy cookies. Most of the time I have an orange ginger crisp. It's cookie. It's very gingery. So cut back on the ginger. If you don't like a lot of ginger, I happen to like it. I don't like spicy food, but that said, I like ancho chili powder in my ganache. That I really do like. Um, so that cookie is really nice with ganache. We have in the course, I have, and, it might, and I might have it online as well, a very thin, such a lace cookie that is made with rice syrup and maple syrup. And it gets very, very lacy. You can bend it into pretty shapes. And that with some of the ganache is killer. 
Sometimes I'll dip a half because I think that looks prettier. And sometimes I'll just do a little drizzle because I want to use less chocolate. Those store in the freezer really, really beautifully. And how I came to that particular cookie, when I'm talking about crispy, when, when I went from the professional pastry kitchen, I was working as a pastry chef making popovers and dozens of eggs every day and cream and milk and sugar and stuff. And so my stomach was just like, I said, I have to find out what's the matter with me. And I left, I had to learn about the properties of these vegan dessert ingredients, including the more natural sweeteners or the less processed sweeteners is the way I call about it. Well, you can't really bake with rice syrup because the cake will be gummy. And if you make some toppings, it gets very hard. But I said, oh, I want a crispy cookie. So I bet in combination with another sweetener, the rice syrup is gonna give me that crunch, which it did. And I happen to like the taste of rice syrup. It tastes like caramel. But I think the best thing to do is to mix things up. And in the case of a truffle, you don't need to add any sugar. If you see the truffle chapter in my cookbook, you're gonna see that there are many variations. You can add some, um, you know, some oil, you can add some sugar. Over time, I have decided you don't really need to do that. You don't really need to do that. Or I'll take cashew cream, thin it, because you know, cashew cream, when you cook it, gets thick, and that's one of the nice things. Do that. I make a lot of my own plant milks, but which isn't to say that I don't have them in my refrigerator or in my pantry as well. And I do some desserts with silken tofu. Um, you know, when I let, when I was transitioning or I said, I'm going to make a modern vegan pastry kitchen with real rules and real, really good quality ingredients, there was nothing much available at the time. I mean, we were pretty much mixing soy milk powder and water and there was stick hydrogenated margarine. I was like, ick, I wasn't using poor quality ingredients before. So the same thing, it's the same thing. We have a lot more choice today, but keeping it simple, when you start with an ingredient that is delicious and processed minimally, then you're good, you know, you're halfway there already. You can't make something taste good if you're starting with something that's rancid, for example. So keep your nuts and seeds and flakes in the freezer or in the refrigerator so that they don't go that's so that they don't go rancid. Yes. Yeah. So question from Pat. Do you have a recipe for a good vegan sourdough bread? Well, I am definitely not a bread baker that said, like everyone else, I was making sour. I was watching a sourdough starter that a neighbor who is an expert in it gave to me. And I think the whole trick is to keep your sourdough starter alive. I don't, there's no milk in a sourdough bread. So I can't see what the problem would be. I think a good search or if you would like to send an email to me, anybody who has any questions, further questions, just send an email to info at frankhostigan.com. I can send you some links to some of those sourdough breads. I was making not a sourdough bread, but a really quick whole grain bool in the beginning of this stay at home. It was very easy to do. I had bread flour and it was, but what happened for me, I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. What happened for me was I was eating half a loaf and that's just not the answer. So I stopped, I stopped doing that. But um, if you have a nice, I see Julie Hassan, if you're interested in gluten-free baking, she actually has a gluten-free sourdough recipe on her website. That's Julie Hassan, H-A-S-S-O-N. And she's a great resource as well. Yeah. Yeah, do you use a lot of aquafaba? I like aquafaba because I think it's so much fun. So I do use it to make meringue. And, mo you know, aquafaba, for people who don't know, is the liquid, 
It's just aqua, water, and faba beans. And a Frenchman discovered that it could whip like meringue. And um, I was a little reluctant to believe that it would work. <laughs> but I took out my KitchenAid mixer one day and I found, you know, all the recipes said drain a can of, drain the liquid from a can of chickpeas and get going. And that didn't make sense to me. I want to be more precise than that. And not all the cans have the same amount of liquid. And I also cook my own chickpeas. So I've discovered that canned chickpeas, you reduce the liquid by about a third to a half a cup, chill it, and then you're good to go. If I'm doing a big instant pot full of chickpeas, I reduce it further. And so I can make meringue for baked Alaska, for pavlova, for meringue cookies, for you know any number of things and torch it and it's like marshmallow. I use some for, as an egg replacer, I will not whip it into, and I have this on my website as well, this beautiful, <laughs> beautiful whipped, it, it's just like meringue, only you're not gonna get salmonella from tasting it because there's no, you know, there's no eggs involved, but um, I've been playing around with something that I'm calling a super egg. And that is, you know, for some of you may know, you take a tablespoon of flax or G chia seed ground, and you add three tablespoons of water, for example, and that makes a gel that is a kind of an egg replacer. I've been playing around with something I call the super egg, which is flax and chia, no flax or chia, and aquafaba. Um, I have an, I was invited to give my opinion for a, an article on egg replacement in Self Magazine. And it's so, in, it was so interesting to me because I always say there is no one size fits all. Eggs have a couple of different functions. So they have liquid, that's easy to replace, right? And they do binding, that's easy to replace. Structure is a little harder, but you can kind of figure it out with some leavening, for example. So I offered my opinions on different egg replacers and they went to other vegan chefs and there were a lot of different opinions. I thought that was great because that's really the way it is. What I'm gonna use maybe for a loaf, you know, a pumpkin bread or a cookie, might be different from what I'm gonna use for a cake, but I really need to tell everybody that because I started doing this before there was vegan desserts, really, there was no aquafaba, there was no, there were no commercial egg replacers, Bob has one, energy. So I had to figure it out. And I went and I thought, you know, during the depression, yeah. there were cakes. They made depression they cake with no eggs, eggs, right? And now they're called the accidentally vegan depression cakes. And I kind of, well, we can make things better. We can be more precise. We have nicer cocoa powder, for example. So I have on my website, a recipe for what I call like the new improved depression cake, but it's leavening. It's that particular cake was non-alkalized cocoa powder and baking soda and vinegar. So I thought baking powder, baking soda, and vinegar. Those are going to live in my cakes. And to this day, I don't really use much egg replacer per se. I do have a whole unit in the Essential Vegan Desserts course on how to use them. Some are fruit sauces. I happen to love prune puree. People don't think about that, but you know that's something that the French pastry people used a lot. It's especially wonderful in chocolate desserts like that little cupcake that I showed you and um, or date or applesauce or, you know, banana. You have to think about the flavor. You have to think about what you're doing. You have to think about what you're doing. But when you are veganizing a recipe, please, there are so many good ones now that you don't have to do some wild, crazy search. Don't just pick something online from someone you don't know <laughs> and go ahead and commit to making a whole recipe because it might, it really might not work and read the recipe all the way through. If something doesn't make sense to you, 
get it sorted out. But again, today there are so many really good vegan recipes available that you should be able to, to sort things out. And then depending on what your dietary system is, you know, if someone says to me, I'm whole food, plant-based, no oil, and I'm gluten-free, and I can't have nuts, and there's this whole long list, I think, what about a gorgeous baked apple or a poached pear, maybe with a little drizzle of this time of the year, some cranberry coulis or a little bit of chocolate sauce. Those are things that we can have. So you, you figure it out for yourself. That's great. Uh, there's a question if you ever have made French macaroons. Oh, the macaron with the aquafaba. I did make them once that for the person who's asking, you might want to join a Facebook group called Aquafaba Hits and Misses. I think there's 100,000 people in that group. Or go to Megan Leal, L-E-A-L, or send me an email if I got that wrong. And she has a, re she's really very good with these macarons. Uh, it's a process. So it's, you're using Aquafaba. You're making them in the same way that you would be making a French macaron that isn't vegan. There's a whole macronage and letting them sit to get a crust and so on. Hardly anyone, myself included, I don't know anybody who made them super successfully the very first time. It's a process, but they're done. That happens to be a dessert that's too sweet for me. So I was like, yay, I did it. They're beautiful. I'm not doing it again. Even the really wonderful ones, they're just, it's not my taste. You know, we all have different tastes. I do want to say that there is a bakery in Florida. One of my dear friends, um, Carolina Molia, the name of the bakery is L'Artisan Creative Bakery. And I had the pleasure to mentor her. She makes some... Um, gorgeous macaron. She ships nationwide and her vegan croissant won best of Miami two years in a row in a blind tasting. And it was a French contest. I mean, can you just imagine when the, when the judges turned around and went, mon dieu, <laughs> it's vegan. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the way, that's the way it goes. That's for sure. There's a really good book that I can re recommend on aquafaba written by Zhu. That's Z-S-U-Dever, D-E-V-E-R. And the name of the book is aquafaba. She's a real, she's a lovely woman and she has a very scientific mind. And there's a lot of good information in that book for people who want to go further, take a deeper dive into the miracle of the spleen. I had a student that, uh, for the essential vegan desserts, the final assignment is a dessert party, five little bites, five little bites. And this woman wanted to do a kind of a purplish colored meringue. And she made the, she used for her aquafaba, some chickpea, which is neutral-ish, you know, beige, and some black bean, and she got purple. So I'm told that even tofu water will work, but the most common and the most reliable to me is the chickpea aquafaba. Yeah. Nice. Well, gosh, you're just a wealth of knowledge. I hope everybody will sign up for your newsletter. I just did. I didn't even know you had one. So I'm, I'm on your list now. And everything that you, you've done is in the show notes, the recipe, all the information on where they can find you in your books. This has just been, this hour's gone so fast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I had a ball. It was great to see you. The questions are good. And I want everybody just eat healthy, be happy, be safe. And, um, you can reach me, as I said, anytime at info at frankhostigan.com. Follow my Instagram, Good Cakes Fran, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Especially now during this more solitary time in our lives, it's really nice to have connection. It's really, and just there's no question that isn't a good question. So thank the only you. question, except for the one that is unasked. That's what uh, my teacher used to say. The only foolish question is the one unasked. That is 
absolutely true. I'm going to use that. That's right. Because someone else is thinking the same thing. Someone else has that question. It's waiting to be asked. So thank you so much, Chef AJ. It's just so good to see you. Well, thank you. You look amazing. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when we'll be featuring some of my favorite vegans, elephants. We're going to be talking to the gentle giant animal sanctuary. It's an elephant sanctuary and you won't want to miss it. So there won't be a cooking demo. The elephants don't know how to cook. <laughs> all right. Take care, Fran. Bye-bye.